Today we're going to be continuing what we discussed last week about growing. And again, I have Mary here from Heirloom Seeds. Uh, Mary, we have some questions to go over. So I'm going to go ahead and start with the first one. Um, when growing, how often should we water our plants? That's a great question uh, because a lot of people overwater or underwater, and that's one of the more common issues people see with their plants. So when you start from seed specifically, you're going to want to make sure that your soil or your growing medium is moist all the time and doesn't dry out, but also isn't sitting in water. So typically that would be once a day, but it also depends on where you're growing. So for example, in the mountains here in the desert, I have to water once a day. And if it's very dry out for seeds, I have to water sometimes twice a day. Whereas in an area like Florida, where it might be raining anyway, you're not gonna have to water every day. So the general rule is you wanna keep your soil moist, but not in standing water. And sometimes that's as easy as just sticking your finger in the soil and seeing if it's moist already. Um, if it's, if you have a good, soil mixture like we mentioned before with compost and uh, with things that are going to keep moisture in your soil generally you can water every other day so it's going to depend on whether you're planting seeds which need more water in the beginning or whether you're just watering your garden which would be every day or every other day less if it's raining gotcha. now if i'm doing a bucket garden like we talked about um, is there is there any way to create drainage, I guess, or is drainage important when you're talking about a, a five-gallon bucket or a three-gallon bucket? So let me back up a little bit. Um, let's go back to the getting started part. Okay. Uh, when you're talking about growing, whether it's from seed or whether you're transplanting, there's a few different options as far as how you're going to grow. So we mentioned before raised bed gardens and raised beds, because you are bringing in the soil, you can control what type of soil you have. Whereas if you're planting in ground, for example, in Florida, typically the soil is very sandy. So the water is just gonna wash right out. The nutrients are typically gonna wash right out unless you amend with different, um, different options like compost or manure. So that's gonna determine, again, how much water you're gonna need. Then you also have bucket or container gardens. Now bucket and container gardens need more water because they dry out faster. Because instead of having this massive amount of soil, you have this small area of soil, and especially when it's hot or when it's dry, the water is gonna be gone fast. So in a bucket garden um, or a container garden, but buckets specifically are the easiest to regulate with water. Um, I use a double bucket system. So I will, every bucket, every container needs drainage. So you definitely don't wanna just plant your, um, plant your seeds in your soil with no drainage. What I typically do is, I have a video on making a bucket garden, and in it I drilled holes in the bottom of my bucket. It can be three holes, it can be six holes, nine, however many you want to put in there, but the more holes, the more the drainage. So you can then place that bucket full of soil in a second bucket. And the double bucket system is great because the water is going to leak down into the second bucket and it's going to stay there and it's going to keep your roots moist. And in order to keep those roots from being rotted out with too much water, you can nick a hole in the side of your bottom bucket so that any excess water drains out up to a certain point. That way it's not drowning in, in, the, um, in the second bucket, but that means you won't have to water it every day or multiple times a day. Um, it, it's a similar situation to if you, if you have a container garden and you make one of those round trays that go underneath it, right. the water goes down into the tray but then the soil can suck that water back up if, you, if the water stays in the tray. So that's another option. Um, and then you have in-ground, 
um, which again is going to take a little more work depending on where you are and depending on where you're growing. Um, again, Florida sandy soil is a little tougher to use because you've got to add so much stuff to it to make it ready to grow. Um, and then you have hydroponic. Hydroponic is all water. So that is another, it's typically a closed system where you're not watering every day because you have a series of buckets or containers. You have a major water source and that water is flowing through your system at all times. So a hydroponic system, there's zero watering involved, but it does need to be maintained on usually a weekly or every other week basis. Awesome. Um, throw a wrench, I didn't ask you this earlier. Um, <laughs> so yeah, you, you mentioned soil and you mentioned hydroponics. I don't think a lot of people realize that there's a difference between hydroponics and aquaponics. Are you familiar with that? I am not an expert on either, <laughs> but right. I do know the difference. Um, aquaponics is typically a, uh, a, like a fish farm you could use as aquaponics. And it's a little different because you have a lot more, in my opinion, a lot more of an eco-friendly option. Um, aquaponics, you have a, a growing environment where you are sustaining life as well. So a lot of people do tilapia in a large closed system. And that um, those nutrients that are provided by the tilapia, essentially like a horse would provide manure for your garden, though that's a source of nutrients for your system to feed your plants. Whereas a hydroponic system is typically a closed system that involves a lot more additions to your, to your water. So a hydroponic system, you would need to add a series of fertilizers throughout the growing period, depending on what you're growing. So I have mentioned in different videos or um, different articles, heavy feeders. So heavy feeders are what we call varieties of vegetables or root crops that require more nutrients than others. So those aren't necessarily on our anti-inflammatory food lists. Most of our anti-inflammatory food lists are not heavy feeders. So you won't have to worry about as much nutrients. Um, but leafy greens would do fantastic in a hydroponic or an aquaponic system. Uh, hydroponic systems can be huge or they can be small. Uh, there are even store-bought options for aquaponics with a single fish tank and say six uh six cups at the top of that fish tank that are using the nutrients to grow so it can be done indoors even if you're if you have a situation where you can't really go outside all the time or you can't be bending over and you just need something small to get started that would be awesome i was thinking about that for somebody who's like wheelchair bound yep exactly that pretty easily and leafy greens can usually be harvested along the outer edge of the base of the plant and they don't need to be completely harvested so something like kale uh, or lettuce would be fantastic options for a very small indoor grow nice what about spices any any preferable spices for something like that like a basil or a thyme or something that you can grow that way basil the basil would be perfect because it's very small. Thai holy basil has a few more nutrient properties um, that have been found for people with um, that need an anti-inflammatory diet. So definitely Thai basil over like a Genovese basil, which is just the general Italian basil. Mm -hmm. Italian basil is great for, um, for spices though as well. Sage would be really good because it adds some flavor to your dish and it doesn't need a lot of growing space. Uh, cilantro could grow really well in a small space. It doesn't require a lot of nutrients either. Awesome. Um, so the next question, how do we companion plant? We discussed companion planting last, in last uh, video, but we really didn't go into how as far as setting it up and 
you know, growing my, my carrots, for instance? How do I keep the rabbits from jumping <laughs> my, my okay. plant, eating the leaves and stuff? So, companion planting is not necessarily going to keep the rabbits away or the cats out of your garden or the deer out of your garden, but it will help with a smaller pest. Um, such as, you know, caterpillars, uh, corn earworms, things like that. Okay. So there are options, though, for you as far as the rabbits, and we'll get to that, too. So as far as companion planting goes, I have a specific planting guide on my website for how many seeds to plant either in an in-ground bed or a four by, not a four by four, excuse me, um, square foot gardening. So you have two, really you've got a lot of different ways to grow, but you have some people that just throw your seeds out and water it and hope it grows. And that's kind of the chaos method. It's what I would call the chaos method. If you're, if you, if you just kind of like to throw your stuff out there and hope it grows, that's definitely one way to do it. But if you like a little more uniform gardens, if you like it a little more specific, if you have things you want to grow that you want to utilize the space the best, you have an in-ground uh, growing or planting cycle and you have a, a raised bed or usually what people do for a square foot garden. Raised beds are the easiest to do square foot gardens because you have already have that square ready to go. And those two guides will tell you how closely to plant your seeds, and then how far apart to put your rows. So again, if you're not into the chaos way of, of growing food and you want things a little more, more simple and more, I mean, really more efficient, in my opinion, the square foot gardening, in my opinion, is the best. It utilizes your space the best way possible. So what you would do for companion planting then is you can do two things. You can either designate a square specifically for that companion plant, or you can interplant the companions within that square. So for example, if you have dill that you wanna plant with your tomato, which by the way, I think is a bad idea, um, but I'm gonna use that as an example. Dill is a companion plant for tomatoes. However, dill attracts the tomato hornworm. So that's why, in my opinion, it's not the best thing to do, but it is one way. Um, and some people like tomato hornworms, and I'll get to that, because they are, they become a hummingbird moth, and a, a sphinx moth. And that is, a sphinx moth is a nighttime pollinator. So even though that hornworm is not what I want growing in my garden, the sphinx moth is a beneficial pollinator once it goes through its cycle. So if you wanted to plant, for example, we'll do something a little less chaotic here, and we'll say marigolds with your tomato. You can plant those marigolds in that same square. You don't have to make its own square. So that's one way of doing it. The other option would be to plant one tomato per square because those tomatoes take a lot more space. And then you would plant, say, um, basil and marigolds in the square next to it. And then you would plant your carrots in the other square. And then in front of that, you could plant borage. So now you have carrots, which are a companion to uh, tomatoes. You have basil and marigolds, which are a companion to tomatoes, and then you have borage, which is an, also a companion. So now you have four squares that are all companions, but all beneficial and something you can eat as well. Gotcha. It can be totally confusing. <laughs> yes, and I was just going to ask you, so is there somewhere on your website that somebody can go and see what you just said, you know, as far as companion planting, what what we can plant with what? I don't have a, I don't have that specific of a guide. What I do have is a long list of different varieties 
and a list of their companions. So for example, it's by alphabetical order. And when you get to the tomatoes, it will tell you all of the things that would be good to plant with tomatoes and the things that are not good to be planted with tomatoes. And it does specify that borage de uh, deters tomato hornworms. It also says that dill will attract them. So in my opinion, I plant the dill way away from the garden because I do want dill in my garden, but I definitely don't want to attract tomato hornworms right next to my tomatoes. Right. Are they an aggressive worm? Do they just like decimate tomatoes? Uh, they can decimate an entire tomato plant in a day or two. That's pretty aggressive. <laughs> so, uh, short story here. Uh, when I went, when I was living in Florida and I went back to California to visit family, I said to Doc, if it doesn't rain, I need you to go out and water my garden. But if it rains, don't worry about anything. So, it rained the whole time I was gone, and he, so he didn't go out and check my garden. Well, what I didn't think about was that if I had a tomato hornworm attack, I would be in trouble. So I got home, and the water, the garden was perfectly watered, thanks to Mother Nature, but I had three pepper plants that were sticks. In four days, however many tomato hornworms that were there stripped my pepper plants down to sticks. Only one of them ultimately survived. And just because you get a tomato hornworm attack doesn't necessarily mean it's the show's over for that tomato, but you have, you're basically starting from scratch. You have your base plant, and then you've got to allow it to recoup and grow more leaves. So it, they can definitely do some damage. Wow. <laughs> All right, so... The third question we have is, and we kind of covered it already, I think, but is there a seed planting pattern that's better than others? In my opinion, yes. I typically use the square foot garden pattern. You can do it in ground or you can do it in a raised bed. Um, and it is using your space the most efficiently. So it is something like 12, radish per square or nine beets per square one pepper per square any of the larger items need more space and if you if you really want to get the best use of your space in my opinion the square foot garden is great what you have to keep in mind is some varieties are more prone to disease so Squash is on my list to talk about today, but it's not necessarily because it's anti-inflammatory. It's because of how easy it is to grow. Now, squash needs open air. If you plant your squash plants too close together, they will get powdery mildew or they can get powdery mildew. And that's usually uh, because it's not getting dry. So if you have a lot of rain and then your leaves get get wet from the soil, it's not getting a chance to dry out. So if you have a lot of airflow in your garden, it, you have less propensity for disease in your garden. So even though your, your raised bed or your, I'm sorry, your square foot garden plan says one per square, if you have a variety that you know is gonna take up a lot more space, you can always give it a lot, little more room. Uh, my sister learned her lesson uh, this time around, she built this awesome raised bed and she put a squash plant right in the middle. And what happened was it expanded out and it was overshadowing some of her other crops. So her carrots and her radish didn't do that well that were right next to the squash because it, it, it shadowed them. So if you have something like a squash, I always recommend that you plant it on the outside of your raised bed. That way, it can take over outside the raised bed, and you're not going to be taking up as much space inside your bed. Gotcha. With the squash, I'm glad you brought that up because I eat all kinds of squash. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's really the easiest to, to make a meal with. But when I was looking, because I want to grow some spaghetti squash, I'd like to grow some acorn squash. Um, some yellow squash, 
zucchini eventually. But I was considering, like you were saying, you know, putting it around the outside and then bringing some lattice work up over. But how would I do something like that without shading? Am I pretty much stuck with that bed being a squash bed? Uh, not necessarily. So the great thing about squash, you're going to have two options here. I have some, actually, I have some examples for you. <laughs> so acorn squash is awesome. Acorn squash is a winter squash. And the reason I have that on my list to talk to you about today is because even though it takes up more space in growing, it can actually sit in your pantry for months before it is needed to be eaten. So as far as shelf life goes, winter squash is one of the absolute best things to grow in your garden. But it takes up a lot of space. So like you said, how do you figure out how to, how to manage that? You don't have to put the trellis completely in your garden bed. You could put the trellis on the edge, say here's your raised bed, you put it on the edge of your raised bed and make your trellis go out. Or if you have two raised beds, one next to each other, and you have here's the edges here, you can make that trellis go from one to the next. And that way, you're planting on the outside of your raised bed and you're using the extra space that is not garden bed, and then you have a way to grow using more space without having to plant in the ground in that space. So that's what I have growing out here. I have pumpkin, uh, also a winter squash. I have Jarhadale pumpkin. It's a blue slate pumpkin. Oh, Looks nice. like that. It's kind of cool, right? It's like, yeah. like a weird blue gray. <laughs> so what I did is it's growing outside the bed and gophers are eating the um the vines that are coming out of the raised bed so i have to find a way to get those vines off the ground without having to use extra i don't want to spend a lot of money so what i did was i took the trellis and i put it inside the raised bed and i made a loop and that trellis sits on the ground so now i'm able to get all of those vines over and off the ground without having to use garden space. Nice. So, How do you train those vines to do that? Does it start yep. growing? It just starts growing that way. So what I did was I pulled them off the ground because the little, the little tendrils that are coming out and trying to grab different stuff, those are all over the ground. So what I did is I just gently lifted them off the ground and placed them on top of uh, the trellis material and they just went crazy. So, as far as trellis material goes, you can use um, any kind of fencing material. If you want the sturdiest stuff possible, you can use cattle paneling, but it's expensive uh, compared to some of the other stuff. You can use, because you're using larger, uh, you're growing larger crops, you can even use uh, chicken wire if you're just trying to get a base. So you're, you're looking for something where it's not necessarily going to get stuck in the little holes. And I guarantee you, well, can't guarantee you because nature has a way of proving us wrong all the time. But most likely, uh, your squash or your produce is not going to go through those holes because chicken wire is very small, but it's inexpensive. So you can buy it and you can wrap it around certain things and it doesn't, um, it doesn't require a lot of, of material. Okay. Um, that. Are most of the vegetables grown fully consumable? In other words, can I eat the whole thing, leaves, roots, the whole nine? Not necessarily. Okay. So I mentioned in the last video, double duty crops. Uh, that would be beets and radish. So the root itself can be eaten, and then the leaves can also be eaten. The problem with that is not necessarily the problem. Broccoli, you can eat the leaves and the actual broccoli, totally edible. Uh, kale, there isn't really a lot of 
ex excess material. It's just the leaves that are being produced in a small little stalk, and then the rest is roots. So you're not going to want to eat kale roots, but it's compostable. So it, everything in the garden is usable or reusable. And in that sense, yes. So you're not going to be necessarily eating squash leaves, even though they are edible, um, but they're also compostable. So I have seen where people will take large squash leaves and they'll steam them and they'll use them similar to like a stuffed cabbage leaf. Oh. Have you ever had like a stuffed cabbage leaf, something oh, yeah. like a Greek food? Oh, yes. You can definitely do that, but it's not as <laughs> it's not as flavorful as a cabbage leaf, um, and it's very prickly. Uh, if you've never grown squash, <laughs> I highly recommend being careful. I have had multiple injuries from squash. But it sounds crazy, and I can hurt myself on the most ridiculous things, but. Uh, what I did was I reached into the to the squash and I twisted the zucchini. So a lot of times I'll do that. If you see that here, wow, it's really <laughs> holy cow! It's a small zucchini, by the way. Um, I have another one here. Oh my I, god! That's, that's a different kind of zucchini. Um, you. So I did a video on squash. Totally getting sidetracked here. And <laughs> I showed in my video, it's on my YouTube channel, the difference between a store-bought zucchini, and it was like flappy and like soggy right. to my homegrown zucchini. And this thing was like five times bigger than a store-bought zucchini. And this is a small one compared to what I grow. So it's definitely, it's definitely worth it to grow your own. Now, back to injuring myself, um, I, squash plants have these little teeny spikes on them, and it's their own built-in defense mechanism. So when I reached in and I twisted it, my hand uh, rubbed against the leaves and the stems of the plant, and I was actually bleeding by the time I made it in. Not bleeding profusely, but I did have a nice little scratch down the side of my hand, like a cat scratch. So they, these plants have their own built-in defense mechanism, which is pretty cool when you think about it. You know, they, they grow their own, you know, their own weapons. <laughs> so um, one of the things that I learned with squash is, you know, to be careful, but while the leaves are edible, I wouldn't necessarily eat them. I just, either feed them to my chickens or I put them in the compost pile. So let me run down my list and I'll tell you. Uh, cabbage we mentioned, you can definitely eat all of the leaves, um, the outside leaves and the inside leaves. Now with cabbage, you have two different types. You have Chinese cabbage, which is uh, most people think of pak choy or bok choy. And then you have heading cabbage. So uh, Chinese cabbage, you just pluck the whole thing and you're good. Regular heading cabbage usually has a lot of outer leaves and then the main leaf. If you go to the grocery store and you see a head of cabbage, usually there was like 10 more leaves underneath it that get pulled off because they're not as pretty. So the outer leaves of the cabbage can definitely be eaten. Um, or if they're not that pretty, you can always put them in your compost pile, which will build nutrients for future soil. Um, kale. It's all leaves, so there's really not much else to eat besides the kale. Uh, radish, you can definitely eat the root and the leaves. Broccoli, you can definitely eat the actual heads of the broccoli and the leaves. Uh, they're very similar to collards, the broccoli leaf. Uh, cauliflower, you can eat the leaves, but most people don't. Um, again, those can be used... Um, in your compost or feed your animals. Um, asparagus, really the only thing that's popping up with asparagus is the actual shoots, so there's not much excess there. Um, spinach, most of what you're going to pull up from your spinach is going to be the actual leaves. 
once it bolts, you can actually eat the flowers. So that is definitely edible. Um, and then for people that like spinach, but maybe you live in a warmer climate that spinach doesn't do very well, spinach is really a cool weather crop. You can plant something called perpetual spinach Swiss chard. So it's actually a Swiss chard, but it looks like and tastes like spinach. So that's a great option for you. And I will say this, Swiss chard can grow for over a year and you can continue to harvest the outer edge of those leaves. So it's really a more bang for your buck than a spinach. Um, and then beets, we already mentioned, you can eat the root and definitely the leaves. With the Swiss chard, um, what was my question with that? <laughs> I don't remember. Well, you said it could be harvested for the, oh, the benefits as far as vitamins and stuff, are those all the same as actual spinach? Because spinach is really high in all your macros and micros. It, it probably isn't as high as spinach, but it's still high in beneficial, you know, any, any leafy green, any dark leafy green is supposed to be very good for people that have anti or have inflammatory issues. So I would say it's not, it doesn't have as high, but it probably has pretty high enough that it's worth it. And especially for someone that lives in a hot climate that, that wants to have a continual harvest, uh, you will get more out of Swiss chard than you will spinach. And honestly, kale would probably have uh, higher or similar than Swiss chard as well. So kale's another one that is pretty good. Specifically, uh, something called Nero de Toscana uh, kale. Um, it's also called dino kale. It is probably the best kale for hot climates. Um, I have a customer in Nicaragua who grows it and it gets really, really hot though there. So um, that's definitely, uh, I take that back. <laughs> I have the wrong name for it. Nero de Toscana is a cabbage that's also the same as lacinato kale, which is dino kale. So one thing I get, I get them all confused, but they're all the same. They're all the same species. They're all the same thing. And the great thing about heirlooms is sometimes they have three different names for the exact same thing because one person in one region called it one thing and another and another called it, you know, dino kale is probably the most popular name for it. Um, but lacinato kale is what it's called. Ah. That's awesome. So I'm going to throw another wrench at you. Uh oh. <laughs> I've been seeing a lot here and there on YouTube about people juicing cannabis and they're using um, a lot of homegrown vegetables to mix into their okay. recipe, I guess. <laughs> sure. um, are you familiar with any of that? Have you seen or heard anything about juicing with cannabis and the benefits or lack of benefits? I don't know about the benefits. Um, I do know somebody who does juice uh, the cannabis leaves. Um, he grows all of his own stuff here, and we're in California, so it's as legal as you can get here. That's why um, I ask, because you're in that state. <laughs> I do know that if grown organically, uh, so say you're growing your own, and you're growing it without the use of the disgusting pesticides that some of the bigger growers use. Um, you see in the news that they are using some stuff that's not even legal on agriculture. So if you're going to do something like, like that, I highly recommend that you know exactly where it came from. Um, but just like any other leafy green, the juicing benefits are going to be there. Um, so if you're juicing kale um, or if you're juicing celery, 
you know, you're going to still get the same benefits. So if there are nutrient properties in those cannabis leaves, then absolutely it's going to be beneficial to you nutrient wise. Um, the only issue I have with uh, juicing is you are losing the pulp. You're losing the, the fiber that you might have benefited from had you actually eaten that celery or whatever it is. But you're not going to find a cannabis salad on the menu anywhere, even in California. So, <laughs> so juicing it probably is going to be just as good as, you know, juicing, you know, celery or spinach. So, yeah, I mean, I don't see anything, anything wrong with it at all. Well, and if you're juicing it too, like you mentioned, the, the pulp, it separates out. I would imagine you could use that pulp, couldn't you, as, as compost, throw it back into your garden? Uh, so my dad's girlfriend juices. She goes through bags and bags of organic carrots and celery, and she has nothing to do with it, so she gives it to me, and I throw it in my compost pile. So anything you don't use in the garden, as long as it's not diseased, so as I mentioned um, with squash and powdery mildew, as long as you don't have a diseased plant, you can throw everything extra into the garden. So anything you don't use can definitely be reused or recycled into something beneficial for your garden. Definitely. Awesome. So I have one last question. Sure. Um, and this probably goes back years, but I think it may be considered an old wives' tale. Maybe it's not. <laughs> Maybe you can clarify. As we were talking about composting, throwing things back into your garden, how beneficial is it for you to throw your eggshells back into your garden as far as being able to get a high calcium return? Eggshells are... Definitely not an old wives' tale, but they are not readily available calcium. So it's definitely beneficial to add them to your compost. It would be better if you crush them before adding it to your garden, just because it it's going to break down faster if it's crushed versus um, versus just thrown in there. I have seen people actually dry them and blend them it's going to kill your blender so i don't um <laughs> seems a little much to me uh but it is a beneficial way to add calcium to your garden uh it's not going to be a quick fix so that's something to keep in mind that it's not it's not the be all end all for calcium so you're going to need to find other ways to supplement calcium if you're just getting started but it's definitely a great thing to add to your soil, or compost, I should say. Okay. Is there something else that they can do so that they don't have any low, low calcium issues or low mineral issues? Or um, a general fertilizer that's not a super, like for example, I don't, I wouldn't do a sixteen, 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 and that's um, that's the NPK of a fertilizer so when you see a fertilizer it has usually three numbers on it um, i wouldn't necessarily recommend a high one just because most of the times those are going to be synthetic your best bet is to add what you can from your own garden and then also supplement with a little bit of extra so if you're buying garden soil we talked about this last time if you're buying garden soil it's already going to have nutrients in it it's not going to be completely devoid of nutrients. And then when you're adding things to it, like whether store-bought compost or mushroom compost or anything like that, you're still going to be adding nutrients to your soil. So while one might be less than another, it's not going to be completely devoid of nutrients. So, I mean, even, even the carrots and the celery pulp that I'm adding to my garden those have nutrients in it. So it's not that it's devoid of nutrients. It just isn't a, you know, it isn't a synthetic shot of a massive amount at one time. So booster shell is another form of calcium that you can definitely add to your soil uh, if you don't already have it um, or if you don't have enough eggshells. So some people don't eat eggs. 
oyster shell is another option that's going to give you nutrients and it's a byproduct of the fishing industry anyway so um those oysters won't weren't killed for their shell uh people ate the oysters and the shell was a byproduct so i really do like um oyster shell as an option in fact i feed it to my chickens because as they produce eggs they need to replenish their calcium and if i don't have enough eggshells to feed back to my chickens i just give them eggshells uh oyster shell okay sounds like a good idea well, that's all the questions that I have today. Um, is there anything else that you had in mind that we should cover? I'll just give you a quick rundown of some of the varieties we discussed in the first video. Um, just a quick rundown of getting started with them. So everything I do is from seed. So specifically, if you're seed starting, um, the general rule for seed starting is uh, the depth of the seed is twice the width of the seed. So I think I mentioned this before, but for very large seeds, obviously it's going to be planted a little deeper than others. But for very small seeds, like um, broccoli we mentioned or cauliflower we mentioned, those are going to be very shallow sown. And if you plant your seed too deep, it's not going to have enough energy to grow out of that soil. So you're definitely, that's probably the number one thing you need to focus on is when you're planting seeds to make sure that the depth is correct. Um, and then second, you talked about watering. That was one of your first questions. Yeah. Um, after, after you plant those seeds, you're gonna wanna gently water. Because if you just take your hose and you shoot it down in the soil, those <laughs> seeds will splash everywhere. So typically for seed starting, if you have a very small seed, Sometimes people will use a spray bottle and spray the soil. And that is the easiest way uh, to do something like that without splashing your seeds everywhere. Uh, like I said, keep your soil moist, but not in soaking water. Because if your soil dries out, your seeds aren't going to germinate properly. But if it's too moist, your seeds are going to rot. So there's a, there's a balance between too much water and not enough water. And people come to me specifically, say, with their tomatoes. And, you know, my leaves, are, my leaves are turning yellow or my leaves are turning brown. Again, you have to focus on the water issue. If you have too much water or not enough water, it's definitely going to affect the way your plant grows. Uh, now, as far as planting goes, uh, cabbage, Chinese cabbage I mentioned, is typically 30 to 50 days from seed to harvest. So it's a lot faster growing than heading cabbage. Uh, heading cabbage is usually the ones that, per, that form a big ball, um, right. and that's going to be 80 to 120 days. Those are also cool weather crops. So if you want something fast, like sooner than 120 days, um, go with the Chinese cabbage instead. Kale, also a really easy one to grow. And it, it's not like cabbage where you grow ahead of, of kale and boom it's gone with kale similar to swiss chard you're going to harvest the outer leaves until it's dead um, and that's usually when it bolts and when it bolts is when it creates this big long stem and it flowers at the top once you have flowers it's done but the cool thing about those flowers is you can usually harvest seeds around those flowers so that's a plus and we'll do seeds seed saving much later um, radish, clone? what's that? Can you clone those leafy vegetables like spinach and kale and all that? All those you know, leafy ones? I've never tried it. Um, I know you can from peppers and I know you can from tomatoes uh, by taking cuttings from them and then cloning them that way. But I've never done uh, leafy greens. And I definitely wouldn't say some like radish or um, the what do you call it? Beets. So definitely not on the root crops, and I have no idea on the other ones. Okay. That's a good question, though. I'll have to look that up. <laughs> um, radish is probably the absolute easiest to grow, along with beets, because they're root crops. So what I wanted to point out is root crops do not do as well in containers as some of the other varieties. 
So because they typically that root, even though the ball of the fruit or produce is right at the surface, they have small roots that grow way down. Right. So those are best planted either in raised beds or in ground. And they're like 30 days from seed to harvest. So if you want super fast maturing, radish is awesome. Uh, beets are 50 to 60 days, so they take a little longer. Uh, broccoli is definitely another uh, cool weather crop, and it's anywhere from 50 to 100 days. Um, and you did mention uh, the uh, companion planting this one. It is susceptible to disease, so you would want to do a companion planting and maybe even neem oil with it. Right. Um, same with cauliflower, exact same situation. Asparagus you mentioned last time as well, it needs in ground. It's definitely not a container variety. It needs a lot of space. And from seed, it's about 365 days. Wow, a whole year? Yeah, a whole year. So sometimes people say that they get a crop right away, but the, the, best, the best crops are going to come after a year because it really needs space to grow before it's going to produce. So you might get a little shoot here and there, but it's really going to start producing after a year. But now the benefit to that is it can grow 10 to 30 years or more in the same place and does not need to be replanted. So you get a lot of bang for your buck in that case as well. Um, spinach we mentioned before too, it's also a 50 day. Um, it can be harvested around the outer edge as well, or you can just harvest the whole thing all at once. So those are, those are the varieties we talked about before. And then uh, you mentioned squash. Uh, they are not necessarily anti-inflammatory, but they're fantastic to grow and very easy. Um, summer squash, easiest to grow and fastest to harvest. It's about 50 to 70 days. And there are some compact varieties that can be grown in containers, um, like yellow scallop squash. And those are the little patty pans, the little teeny yellow uh, with the ribs around the outside. Yes. Uh, that's called patty pan squash. Uh, that's a really quick one. And then winter squash is on my list because while it needs a lot of space to grow, they will last on your counter for months or in a a pantry or a root cellar for months. Some of my customers have said that they had had such a huge butternut squash uh, harvest, which is a winter squash, right. that they were eating the last of their butternut squash as their next year's harvest was producing. So that's pretty good. That's, that's a long shelf life for us. <laughs> it's a very long shelf life. And there's ways you can... Uh, you can prolong your shelf life, like oiling it, and um, some people use an edible wax. I don't, but there are a lot of different ways that you can do that. Okay, interesting. So we're running out of time today. Okay. Kind of looking forward to what you've come up with with recipes. I have a lot of good ones. <laughs> yes, I'm excited. I've seen some of the finished products and pictures on your Facebook page, so I'm excited about touching on that next. Um, but thank you for being here today and taking the time out. I know you've been really busy, and this has been uh, definitely educational. Good. And I hope uh, I hope everybody else gets out of it what I've gotten out of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm happy that you invited me to join you. So anytime you need more recipes, I'm working on them as we speak. <laughs> awesome. Um, make sure we put links, uh, send me links so that I can put them down in the, uh, in the feed for the video uh, for everything that we talked about today as far as like um, seeds and, and stuff. I know you talked about putting together some different seed packs for autoimmune. Yep. That would I be Really awesome. I'll send you uh, later on this evening. I gotta get that one finished. Okay. That would be great because I know everybody would appreciate that. Cool. All right. So I hope everybody has a great rest of their week. And don't forget to hug a vet. <laughs>